What is up everybody and welcome to 31 on 31 Monsters and Machines, also known as 31 on 31 Schwarzenegger and some shit Brian picked. Hey yo, what the fuck? For those that might be joining for the very first time, 31 on 31 is a collaborative effort amongst the four channels that make up Autop Stream. That would be my channel, Willis Scredia, Brian Lomax, and Sean Chandler talks about. The links to all of their videos will be down below. By the time you see this video, all of their videos should have gone live, so click down below, let them know Cody sent you, and see how our 31s differ from each other. And this one, is going to get ugly. And for this episode, Monsters and Machines, we're taking on the sci-fi genre. So we've got Blade Runner, Alien, Predator, Robocop, Total Recall, The Terminator, and finally, The Matrix. All 31 films ranked against each other from worst to best. And this is a stacked list. This is a list that I was very excited for because many of my favorite films of all time are in this list. And most of these franchises are franchises I would say I enjoy most of the films in them so it's gonna be fun strap in because here we go coming in at 31 is gonna be alien 3 now for those that have been following me for a while know that I absolutely despise this movie I'm a big fan of aliens you'll see that significantly higher on this list and I just despise what this movie does to the characters of aliens in the first two minutes what the fuck is that for me, that completely shits on their story arcs and the characters from the second film. It completely destroys any of the victory, any of the momentum that was built by that second film, all to give us a very inferior sequel. Now, is the movie watchable? Is the movie decent enough? Yes, if you can get past that opening couple of minutes or it doesn't bother you that much, I understand why some people like this movie much more than I do. But no matter what cut you watch, unfortunately, that is the story they decided to tell us and that is a story that I never enjoy going through. Number 30 is going to be The Predator. Now, for the six years that I have been on YouTube, this is still the most disappointing theater experience that I have had with a film that I was anticipating. So this is a movie that I would have bet money, I would have bet body parts, that this is going to be a knockout because you have Shane Black, one of my favorite writers and one of my favorite directors working today, taking on a franchise that totally needed a new shot in the arm. And he was also a star of the first film. So it just seemed like all the stars were aligning for this to be a Predator film to finally match the quality of that first film. And to me, this is the worst of the entire franchise. It's just an absolute mess. I'll never know if Shane Black's original idea was any better because this is a film that's infamous for its behind the scenes issues. There was mandated reshoots. There was new scripts. There was an entire third act regarding predators helping out the human characters on tanks that was just scrapped and cut out of the film. The cut that we have doesn't make any narrative sense because their reference a knight that doesn't even exist in the film. It's not very funny, which is weird for a Shane Black script for it not to be funny. The CGI on the gigantic monster predator. I, mean, I could just go down the list of things that piss me off about this movie. The more time goes on, the more I dislike it. Number 29, AVP Requiem. Now, on one hand, if you want just absolute schlockfest gore, from the alien and the predator fighting each other, this film will deliver that where the first film did not. Everything else this film gives you is far inferior to AVP, which many people don't even consider to be that high of a bar to begin with. This is a film that goes heavy into the R rating, but goes too far with it, to the point where it's so violent, it's so gory, it's so bleak, that it kind of takes away from the fun of the concept of having alien and predators fight each other, and the whole fucking movie was shot without a single light on set. <laughs> Seriously, try to watch this movie at any time of the day besides like midnight and try to make out any detail whatsoever in the picture. I mean, it is so dark narratively, it is so dark tone wise, and it is so dark visually that it is almost unwatchable. Number 28 is RoboCop 3. This is one of two movies that I watched for the very first time for this list. Now, RoboCop 3 was a movie I did not have very high expectations for because I was of the understanding that this was not a very popular film amongst RoboCop fans. So I walked into it not expecting much and I didn't really get much in return. I will say it took me a little bit to realize that it wasn't Peter Weller in uh, the RoboCop suit. We'll talk more about that when we get to the other films, but the guy that they got to replace him is an actor I do like a lot. He was really good in Thinner. He was great in Rescue Me, his cousin Mickey. So it was kind of fun to see him do that role. That was about the only 
level of enjoyment I got out of this film. This is an absolute 90s schlock fest. This is something that is extremely silly. It doesn't take the Robocop franchise in a direction that I don't think anybody wanted to go. The only thing I remember about this film that will stick with me forever is the smiling android ninja guy. That's just supposed to be this big antagonist. They're going to build up this ninja fight with Robocop and it ended up being some of the worst choreography I've ever seen in my life. But the whole movie, you got a side of him that's just like, Story's not noteworthy. You've got the, uh, the female cop from the first film and the second film that gets killed off here, which I guess was a contractual obligation. She's like, I will be in your shitty ass movie, but you're going to kill me off in the first act. Thank you. I'll cash my check now. Peace. And RoboCop flies. You know, that, that's the only thing that I will take away as a revelation from RoboCop 3, is that after all of these years, I finally figure out that Iron Man has been ripping off RoboCop 3 all along, you son of a bitch. Number 27, oh, Matrix fans get ready to hate me. Matrix Revolutions. I am not a fan of any of the Matrix sequels. You will find that out very shortly. Matrix Revolutions to me is an absolute jumbled mess. It is not a satisfying conclusion, even though that we have the fourth film now, so it's not the conclusion anymore. Even as a third chapter, it just doesn't work for me. It doesn't carry on any of the things that I like about the original Matrix, of the things that I would go to a Matrix film for. It yet again, just like with Matrix Reloaded, gets bogged down in all of the convoluted mythology and the lore of this world. It starts to create all of these really headache-inducing sequences. It overcomplicates the fuck out of everything that's going on. I don't think that any of the action sequences are really all that satisfying. You got all the people in Zion that are in like the little mech suits that are just shooting at a hole for the entire third act. You've got the whole fight with thousands of smiths where they're just going to watch when he fights the one like smith prime not a very satisfying final fight for those two characters it's just nothing about this movie i really enjoy it's been years years since i rewatched it but i reviewed it last year in anticipation for the fourth matrix film and i was just quickly reminded about how much i do not like any of these matrix sequels and to that point number 26 is matrix resurrections now this one and my 25 i gotta be honest they might as well be tied because there's things about them that i like there's a lot of things that i don't like but they're pretty much even keel as far as my dissatisfaction with them now i did not have a lot of expectations for this movie i didn't have a whole lot of faith in this film this seemed like something that was just way too late it seemed like warner brothers just trying to grasp at any franchise potential that they still had left in their back pocket i didn't really have a whole lot of confidence in the fact that only one of the wachowskis was returning for this and this movie takes a very meta approach to the matrix universe that I just did not like. Again, just more ideas to keep fleshing out this universe that I don't personally enjoy. To me, it lessens the impact, it lessens how great the original film was, and I will die on the hill that The Matrix is one of those movies that should have never been a franchise. But Matrix Resurrections, it just, it starts off as this meta exploration about the Matrix were actually like these video games that Neo was creating and it, he's not sure what's real and what's not. You've got a recasting of Morpheus, which I didn't really care for. They did their best, but you're, you're not Morpheus. You're not going to recast that role. The whole storyline kind of revolving around Neo and Trinity and their love for each other. That was never really the thing that I focused on with the original Matrix either. So just going back to this being like this love story across these wild dimensions. It, no, no thanks. Not really my thing. And all of the action in this movie didn't really do it for me either. It's not nearly as impressive as it was back in the 90s with the first film. So it just seems like more Matrix stuff. And I don't get any enjoyment with Neo just being the, the force push guy. When he's fighting, when you get the choreography from the first film, he's a badass character. When you overpower the fuck out of him like they have in all of these sequels, and all he does is... That's not interesting to me. That, that's not an exciting fight sequence. He just holds his hands out and everybody flies backwards in slow motion. No. No, sorry, not for me. And 25, if you haven't guessed it, is Matrix Reloaded. Now, again, this one, it's, I, ask me tomorrow, I could swap 25 and 26, but I really don't care for either one of them. Matrix Reloaded did have some standout sequences to it. There was a couple of fight scenes in it that were interesting, although used a little bit too much of 
early, not quite up to par CGI, made it look a little bit like a video game character in hindsight, but there are some standout sequences, mostly the, the highway sequence where you have Morpheus and everybody like launching across this uh, semi-trailer that just crushed. That's still a really cool sequence. There was some somewhat interesting ideas that they were trying to introduce here to try to expand the lore and make the movie a lot more philosophical and a lot more deep than I think the original film really was. And that's something that I'm always mixed on. I like ambition. I like trying to go for big ideas, but if you don't quite reach what you're trying to grab, to me, it's a double-edged sword. And pretty much the same thing I said with Matrix Resurrections. Whenever you have Neo so overpowered to where he just stops all the bullets like this, he does the force push thing, and he's just killing Agent Smiths like he's going out of style. It's just not as exciting, not as grounded, not as gritty as it was in that first film. Number 24 is RoboCop 2. This is the other film that I watched for the very first time. I had never seen the RoboCop sequels before, and uh, this one was fine. You know, this one kind of met my expectations for what a RoboCop sequel would be. I didn't expect it to be anywhere near as good as the first film, but I didn't expect it to be a complete train wreck like 3 seemed to be, and it just fell in line with that. It's a passable RoboCop sequel. I think that there's some interesting things in here that make it kind of stand out for all the wrong reasons. You've got uh, Tom Noonan here as the villain, and I think that he's a very odd pick for this type of villain. He always seems to play villains really well when they're like a little insane and they're a little bit uh, quirky and kind of disturbing, where this is a character that's supposed to be like an intimidating figure. He's got like the nose piercing and he's uh, in charge of a bunch of drug runners and just... It doesn't really fit his role, and then eventually he gets killed and gets turned into this new RoboCop, which I was really thinking it was going to be cool because I thought he was going to be part man, part machine, just like RoboCop, but no, he's just a, a really bad, really bad, like, computer digital graphic face where you have a robot that has a computer screen with a face floating around and is, like, just doing different emotions, and he's, like, he's smiling, and then... I also thought it was hilarious that this film, uh, aside from Tom Noonan, the big villain of the film is like an eight-year-old kid. You got this kid that's hanging out with these gangsters and he takes over the operation when Tom Noonan is dead and he's sitting at a table with a bunch of adults like talking shit and telling them what's about to go down. And it just, it was so weird to me. It was so funny to see this kid running shit and nobody like smacking the fuck out of him off of the table. Uh, and the fact that he was going up against RoboCop and he was actually shooting other cops. I was like, whoa, okay, I'll give you credit. You know, you, you went for that idea and you actually stuck with it, but goddamn. But unfortunately, it's just missing all of those it factors that makes the RoboCop original such an iconic classic. And it's just a very basic sci-fi action film. It's missing a lot of the violence, a lot of the gratuitous violence from the first film. It's missing most of the social commentary or anything kind of brewing underneath any of the layers of the first film. I don't think that Peter Weller does anything with the role in the second film to expand on Alex Murphy, which is a, a role that I might piss a few people off by saying is not really the most interesting character in the world. So there's a lot of room to do some things with RoboCop that they just never bothered to do. He just walks around and is like, thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> Number 23. It's like we just stepped into a village people video. Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines. Now I'll be straight up with you, if I watched this movie for the very first time as an adult, I probably would hate it. Maybe not on the level that Brian does. <sighs> Ooh. But I'm sure I wouldn't be as forgiving of it as I am. Now there's certainly some nostalgia at play here. I saw this movie in theaters with my dad when I was young. I didn't have the most critical taste in the world, so I enjoyed all of the goofy humor. I enjoyed the strip club sequence. I enjoyed the talk to the hand stuff. Things that would probably make my balls ache if I saw it for the first time as an adult, but it is what it is. You know, whenever you see a film, your age certainly plays into that. Now, I will say that there are some things to enjoy about this. It's a very basic level Terminator film. It is nowhere, nowhere even in the ballpark of the quality of the first two films or even some of the sequels that came after it. But 
I still enjoy a bad Terminator film for being a Terminator film. I think that Arnold Schwarzenegger does pretty good here, aside from some of the things they ask him to do as the T-800. I like Claire Danes as Catherine Brewster and the addition of that character, kind of filling out some of the, the other Resistance characters that we never heard about. I think there's some decent action sequences here. Other than that, it's as bad as a lot of people say it is for all the reasons that they say it is. It's not very well written. It's a total rehash of the first two films, but not nearly in the same quality. Nick Stahl is a terrible, absolutely terrible John Connor, uh, arguably the worst of all of the John Connors. Honestly, he just doesn't fit that role whatsoever. He does his best, but it just, it doesn't work. And Kristana Loken as the TX, not only is she certainly not an actress, but the design, the uh, concept itself of the TX, I don't think is very good. This is a problem that Terminator sequels have had until Dark Fate, really, to where they go, hmm, how are we going to top the T-1000? Ah, give it tits. Number 22 is going to be Prometheus. Now, I will say, just because of how much I like the movies above it, it seems strange to me that this movie was this low, because I'm not a big fan of it, but it didn't seem like 22 was the level that this film is for me. But nonetheless, that's where it landed. Prometheus, for me, is always a very frustrating watch. There's things about it that I can appreciate. There's things about it that I can certainly get into, but it just feels like two movie ideas battling with itself. You've got the promised Alien prequel, which is the concept that was given for this film that got most of us into the seats to watch this, and then you have Ridley Scott's very high concept exploration of creations and creators and their relationships with each other. And this is 90% that movie, when the reason I was there was for the 10% Alien prequel. Uh, there's very good special effects here. It's a gorgeous movie. There are some really good performances. There is some characters that I enjoy, like David, the Michael Fassbender's character, is certainly the shining star of these two movies, and he is the reason to watch a very interesting character arc. But it's just not a movie that really interests me all that much. Every time that I rewatch it, I want to walk away getting it more. I want to walk away and go, ah, it finally clicked. Now I understand why some of you love this, but it just never ends up being that way. I always end up watching it and going, eh. There's some cool ideas here, but this is just not the movie for me. Number 21 is Terminator Genesis. Now, this is on paper probably the worst Terminator film, but it's so bonkers. It's so nuts and ridiculous with some of the things that it does that I can enjoy it for how ridiculous it is. Like, I would definitely watch this before I would watch Terminator 3, which is much more of a traditional Terminator film. I like the fact that they go back and go through some of the events of the first film and you've got Kyle Reese's arrival and they reframe it to where the Terminator uh, was killed by another Terminator from the first film and that becomes a protector for Sarah Connor who is now somebody that protects Kyle Reese and kind of reframes all the events in a way that I thought was a really interesting way to kick the movie off. Unfortunately, it goes completely off the rails once John Connor is revealed to be a Terminator, something that the marketing gave away. Fuck you, trailers. And so all of the interesting things, all the subverted expectations from the lore and the story that we know in the first act of the film is pretty much given away for just having bigger and louder action sequences. And this has never really been a franchise that gets better the bigger and the more CG that it gets. And they clearly had ideas in this film that they were holding off on the payoff for eventual sequels. This was, again, another Terminator franchise installment that was intended to kick off a trilogy and was one of three attempts at that that completely fell on their face where everybody in the movie was like, all right, we'll see you next time. And everybody in the theater is like, no, the fuck we won't. Number 20 is going to be Predator 2. Maybe the most take it or leave it movie on this list. I've never been a gigantic fan of it. I've never been a big hater of it. There's things about it that I enjoy. Having the Predator in the concrete jungle, in that urban setting, the city landscape, I think is a very interesting change of pace. So I like all of that. Uh, it certainly still has some of the violence in the gore the first film so i appreciate that as well danny glover is awesome especially in the third act he's just one of those actors that i enjoy watching everything else about this movie 
brings it down. It's a very cliche, generic 90s cop story with predator shit going on. And so every time the predator is not the focus of what's going on on screen, the movie completely loses me. It's very silly. It's very over the top and generic in spots. So it's a film that I totally get a lot of people having nostalgia for. I'm just not one of those people. Number 19, Alien Covenant. Pretty much everything that I said about Prometheus you can apply here, but less disappointment. This is a film that tries to balance that Alien and Ridley Scott creator story a little bit more, so it's like 70% Ridley Scott creator story and 30% Alien stuff. And for aspects of that, this movie is easier for me to watch because it has more of the horror, more of the body horror, more of the Alien franchise stuff that I actually come to this film for. And on the other side, it's also a bit more frustrating than Prometheus because it tries to please everybody. And as we often see in storytelling and especially in movies, when you try to please everybody, you often end up pleasing nobody. And so the people that really love the Prometheus stuff felt shortchanged. And the people that really love the alien stuff feel like you just kind of tossed us a bone to shut us up. And so it ended up being another movie to where they marketed the fuck out of it, all with Xenomorph. The poster is Xenomorph, the trailer was all about Xenomorph, and you go to watch the movie and you're like, oh, that's like 45 minutes of this fucking thing. I do think it's interesting how they continue to develop the character of David, Michael Fassbender again, very good in this. I think that the surrounding characters are more likable, more enjoyable overall in this film as well. So I can watch this and have a decent enough time with it, but if I'm ever in an alien mood, Prometheus and Alien Covenant are oftentimes, aside from Alien 3, the last ones that I grab. Number 18 is going to be the Total Recall remake. Now, this is absolutely one of those remakes that I think deserves a lot more praise than it actually gets. It's not fantastic. It's certainly not as good as the original film, since you haven't seen that on this list yet. But for a remake, I often want them to do something very different with the concept. If you're going to go after a beloved classic or a movie that people have celebrated for years or decades, you better do something different with it. Don't just do a cut and paste version of that with modern cameras. And I think that this remake does that. It takes a very different approach that's not on Mars whatsoever. I think that the very action focus of this is different from a lot more of the sci-fi focus and the, the Verhoeven style violence of the first film. Uh, I think some of the different layers of the characters are approached in a different way than the first film and the villain and the overall motivation and the whole introduction of like this interplanet transportation system where they go through the Earth's core was an interesting concept. So they really do shoot for the stars as far as trying to make a Total Recall movie that holds on to the initial concept, but does it in a very different way. And I think that they mostly succeed with that. I also think that Len Wiseman is a highly, highly underappreciated action director. I love the first two Underworld movies. I love Live Free or Die Hard. I really enjoy this movie. And one thing that you can say about all of them, regardless if you're a fan of them or not, is that he shoots action like a motherfucker. And this movie has a lot of very cool, exciting sequences. I also really like the casting. I think that uh, Brian Cranston as the villain, even though he's in the movie just a little bit, of course you guys know I'm a Breaking Bad whore, so I am never going to not smile when I see that man on screen. You've got Colin Farrell as Quaid here. I think he brings a different element to the movie and to the character that Arnold Schwarzenegger did, and I love Colin Farrell. You've got Kate Beckinsale, who's the wife and regular collaborator of Len Wiseman. I think that she's awesome in the Sharon Stone role. Jessica Biel's okay. They don't give her near as much to do as they do Kate Beckinsale, but all throughout the movie, there's so many things about it that I do like. The only thing about it that brings it down is that there's the other movie to compare it to, and it's just not as interesting, not as impactful, or not as memorable as the first film. Arnold Schwarzenegger will always be more memorable than the Colin Farrell version. The different levels of villains we get in the first film are going to be more memorable than the ones we get here. The level of violence and the rated R nudity and shit that we get in the first film, much more impactful than the stuff that we get in this film. So much like the Robocop remake that we're going to be talking about, the biggest flaw of these movies is that there's another one that's just better. One thing I will say, though, that makes no sense in this remake, if we're not going to spend time with Mars and mutants, why the hell is there a chick with three tits? Make that make sense. Number 17 is going to be Alien Resurrection. Now, I know there's a lot of people that despise this movie, but I'm actually somebody that enjoys much more of it than I do not. Now, the alien baby 
hybrid fucking thing in the third act, yeah, that can go to hell. Totally agree with that. That was a gigantic mistake. There's a couple of moments in this movie that's a little too goofy for the tone that they're going for. Absolutely. But I actually like the more villainous version of Ripley that we get here. I love the cast that we have. It's a very unusual cast where you got Ron Perlman, you've got uh, Winona Ryder, you've got Michael Wincott. It's like all these B-movie actors that I love. You have a lot of interesting things going on here regarding this space station that is trying to regrow xenomorphs and some pretty decent gore as well. I love the underwater sequence. I think the movie's a lot better than people give it credit for. It's not on the level of the first two films, but just like with the Terminator franchise, I don't walk into a new Alien film expecting them to match the quality of two of the greatest films ever made. Number 16 is going to be Alien vs. Predator. Now, this is another film that is low-hanging fruit. It's certainly one of those guilty pleasure type films, but I have a lot of fun with it. The only thing that I'm missing is the violence and the gore of the original films in these franchises. I think it's weird that you have xenomorphs and predators fighting each other and there's not a whole lot of blood, but nonetheless, it's still a fun action-y adventure for me whenever I do watch this. So I like some of the lore that they bring in here regarding the predators and this hunting ground and this pyramid and the fact that they've been using xenomorphs to undergo this hunting process for a long time. I think that was a really cool narrative idea there. The way that they eventually build up to the queen as like the boss of the video game. The way that the Predator teams up with Sana Lathan. Even some of the human characters getting Lance Henriksen back into this franchise was fun. So it's not great cinema. It's not near the type of movie that the original two are, but see my previous statement in the last uh, installment of this list. I just think it's a good time if you want to see aliens and predators knocking around each other. Number 15 is the RoboCop remake. Make this make sense to me, guys. Why the fuck do you guys hate this movie so much? All you RoboCop fans, explain it. What's the problem? Now again, like I said with the Total Recall, I get it. You're taking a rated R, very rated R, iconic classic like Ro uh, RoboCop and trying to do a PG-13 more action-y version of it. Yeah, by comparison, of course, it's not going to be as memorable, as interesting, as impactful as the original film. But take that stigma out of it, and what the fuck is wrong with this movie? Get your bullets ready, because here I come. The suit is better than the original suit. I'll die on that hill all day long. I think they do a really interesting exploration of man and machine and drone warfare, and they have a little bit of that social commentary and all those layers of the first film, but in a much more modern sense. I think that Joel Kinnaman is easily a better actor than Peter Weller. What a joke. Now, I love Peter Weller. I haven't talked about the original RoboCop yet, so calm the fuck down, but he is a better actor, and he does a lot more in emotional range than Peter Weller did in both of the RoboCop movies. And to top it all off, even though it's not the best action in the world, the action specifically in this movie is better than the original RoboCop. So you have a modern adaptation of RoboCop that has a lot of things going for it, that has a great lead actor that I personally am a really big fan of ever since I saw him in The Killing. You got a lot of the things that we love the original RoboCop for, it's just not as bloody, not as violent. I don't get why everybody hates this film. One thing I will say against it and why I'm not putting it higher on this list, potentially even higher than the first film, as much of a really scorching hot take that would be, is because in the third act of the film, it does feel like it was rushed. It does feel like there's a good 15 minutes cut out of this movie that it desperately needs. The whole mystery regarding the murder of Alex Murphy and the person that's ultimately responsible for it just kind of feels like they picked somebody in the room and there's not a whole lot of payoff to that. The It's a villain problem, really. The villains of who killed Alex Murphy and also the villain of Michael Keaton and the corporation, they don't really have a narrative that comes together in a way where the first film had them. And even by the just the regular villain of Michael Keaton, the big corporate bad guy, he's not the most interesting version of that character. Michael Keaton actually kind of overdoes it in this film a little bit, which seems strange for Michael Keaton and Robocop for me to say that, but I will say that. And so by the time you get to the end in the third act and he's taking on OCP and he's, you know, going through and killing all of these different androids and he murks his way all the way up to the helipad to take down Michael Keaton, you don't really care because they haven't really established him very well as the villain of the movie. So I will agree with you on all of that. Everything else, I don't know what the fuck you guys are on. Number 14. I love you, Brian. Blade Runner. I've tried, guys. I have tried. <laughs> I have tried and tried to be one of you loyal Blade Runner enthusiasts, but this movie is just not for me. And I'm surprised that it made it this high on the list with how much 
desire I don't have to really rewatch this movie. The first time that I watched it, I walked in with the total wrong expectations. I thought it was going to be more action-packed. I expected Harrison Ford's character of Decker to be more of a movie hero, and that is not this movie at all. Second time that I watched it, when I knew what movie I was walking into, I enjoyed it much more. Now this time, the third time that I've watched it, I pretty much enjoyed it on the same level as the second one, but just not as enthusiastic. This is a film that has some interesting ideas. I certainly get the cult appeal to it. It was cyberpunk before cyberpunk was cool. And I think there's some interesting layers to the movie as well. I like the fact that there's all these theories and all these little fan narratives of is Deckard a replicant? Is he not a replicant? And all these different ways you can interpret the film. I like when a movie has little onion layers that you can peel back and come up with your own interpretations like that. So I'm all for that. It's just fucking boring. You have this concept of this guy who is a cop that is only there to kill these replicants and he's going off on this assassin mission to kill these four rogue replicants. And that just, that puts this concept in my head of like, that's gonna be fucking badass to watch. And it's so goddamn slow. Even when you get to the confrontations with these characters, Deckard is an absolute pussy. When you put Han Solo and Indiana fucking Jones in the role of Deckard, I expect him to kick a little bit of ass in this movie, but he gets his ass beat by every single one of these replicants to the point where half of them he doesn't even really kill himself. And the ultimate confrontation between him and Rutger Hauer, he loses and he only lives because Rutger Hauer takes mercy on him and allows him to live. Now it's a very good scene. I like the whole poem that he has about tears in the rain. It's a very cool movie moment, but it's not the most exciting or the most interesting version of that story. I, I just never seen it. Uh, all the cuts that this movie has, I've never seen the version of Blade Runner that would match my own personal movie tastes. And one more thing that I'll say about Blade Runner, because one thing that I did have a revelation about this rewatch really opened my eyes to some things. Blade Runner is all about sex robots. Think about it. All these replicants were created for slave labor. The Tyrell guy that gets his eyes gouged out by Roy Beatty, he has these four replicants that he clearly has been doing some very nasty, freaky shit with that he wants them wiped off the face of the earth so that their memories can never be shared with anybody else. So he hires Deckard to go and wipe out all of their nasty little sex memories. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. He found Captain Winky! You have the character of Rachel, who is his most loyal sex robot, that eventually leaves and goes and becomes the sex robot for Harrison Ford's character. So he puts a hit out on her as well. And by the end of the movie, after he has wiped out all of the rogue sex robots, he decides, fuck it, I'm taking this one for myself and hightailing it. Even when you get into 2049, what is the name of the character played by Ana de Armas? What is the name of the girlfriend AI? J-O-I. What? I rest my case. You're gonna tell me I'm wrong? I'm onto your freaky kinks, Brian. Number 13 is Terminator Salvation. Now this is another one of those Terminator installments that I've always been upset that we did not get a continuation of. I think that they actually had some really good ideas here to continue this franchise, to tell new stories, to do something different with the formula of Terminator, while also filling out some of the backstory and enhancing some of the backstory. And so I really do enjoy this movie. I like Christian Bale in the role of John Connor. He doesn't knock it out of the park by any means, but he's a good John Connor. I really love Sam Worthington's character in this, even though, again, the trailers told everybody that he was a Terminator. Fuck you, trailers. Anton Yelchin, rest in peace, was awesome as a young Kyle Reese. He was believable. I loved all the little ways that they tied in little moments and Easter eggs and fan winks to the original film with showing him how to do the little shotgun sling and things like that that fans will recognize, but the movie doesn't like stop and come to a halt to put focus onto it. I think that there's some really good action sequences in here. The way that it is taking place in the future war and we get some new models of like gigantic Terminators and everything was entertaining. Even the way that they leave it off with John Connor getting scarred and him getting the heart of a Terminator. Like it's cool little extra lore that I think actually makes John Connor the character a little bit more interesting. So there was so many things about this movie that I enjoy so much. I love revisiting it. I think it works very well as a prequel or a sequel because of that whole time continuum fucking thing. And I really wish we could have seen more. Number 12 is Blade Runner 2049. Now, admittedly, there's a, still a lot of the same 
not really criticisms, but just lack of interest from me regarding the story and the tone and the approach of this film that is the same as the original Blade Runner. But why I like this movie a good bit more than the original Blade Runner is that this is more of a mystery. There's a lot more intrigue built into the narrative here just by design. You got Ryan Gosling as this replicant Blade Runner. He's out to try to find the child of a replicant. There's these interesting ideas brought up about these artificial creations now being able to reproduce. A much more interesting version of that theme, that story, than Prometheus and Alien Covenant in my mind. And it leads to this mystery of trying to find this child, of trying to go through all these little clues. And so it's got a little bit of a detail detective noir feel to it. And so I enjoy that much more. I enjoy that type of storyline in this world with this tone, with this pacing, than I do having Harrison Ford go on this assassination mission where he just looks like a little bitch every single time he gets into confrontations with one of them. The way that they expand on the story and the lore of the first film I thought was really smart because there's ways that they answer certain things and then there's ways that they leave things open to interpretation so it doesn't destroy that kind of multi-layered ambiguity of the first film and bar none this is the best looking film on this list there's some amazing looking films on this list but blade runner 2049 i mean it just looks fucking phenomenal this is one of those films you could just have playing in the background and be mesmerized by what's going on with no dialogue and without paying attention to the actual story going on some better action sequences as well. The fight scene, some of the shooting scenes are interesting. Uh, it's a movie that I do like. It's not something that I'll rewatch very often. It's not one of my favorite movies. It's certainly not gonna be at the top of my list, but if I'm gonna watch a Blade Runner film, I much prefer this one to the original. Number 11 is Predators. Now, this is a sequel that I didn't really care too much for the first time that I watched it. The more that I've watched it, I've really grown to appreciate it, to where it's in competition for my second favorite Predator film. As of right now, it's my third. I like the concept here where you get all these different characters, these different killers, these different prey that get launched onto this planet and the whole planet is a hunting ground for these different factions of predators. It's a movie in this franchise that does the best job at expanding the lore of the Predators without getting fucking stupid. The cast here and the characters that they are playing are very entertaining. The action sequences are awesome. It holds on to some of those horror elements really well from the first film. And I think it leaves it off in an interesting place that I feel like I've said this a dozen times in this list at this point, would have been great to see where they went with that. But unfortunately, it wasn't financially successful enough to merit that. And so we ended up getting the Predator. The only thing that continuously holds this movie back for me is that I just don't buy Adrian Brody in that lead role. I think that he is totally trying too hard. I think that he's miscast for that type of role. He would do great for a role in this movie. He's a great actor, but when you have him trying to be like the ultra tough guy and he's doing his best like Christian Bale impersonation, it just doesn't come across very well to me. I'm mean, here, yeah, kill me. Where were the other drugs going? That actor covering himself in mud, replicating the Arnold Schwarzenegger sequence from the first film does not fucking work. Number 10 is the newest addition to this list and that is Prey, which was a welcome surprise for this franchise. Totally gets us back on track. This does everything it can to tap into a lot of that classic appeal of the first Predator film without ever sliding into feeling like it is just regurgitating that film or retreading familiar ground. You have it as a period piece back in like the 1700s. You have Native Americans with, you know, axes and bows and spears and shit going against a predator. So it's a species of the predator that also scales back its technology to be like kind of a fair fight, which I thought was cool because there's a lot more hand-to-hand -hand visceral combat in this movie versus just a lot of plasma blasts and things like that where the predator has a very clear advantage. He's still pretty fucking advantage, but it's a little more fair. I like the main character here. I like the performance of the lead actress. I think that the journey that she goes on is a very interesting character arc, albeit a little bit cliched. You have the girl that's trying to prove herself to her tribe. We've seen that before, but it's a good version of that. And I like the design of this version of a Predator. Every time they do a different design on Predators, I'm always curious to see the changes, and I liked this one. So this is a movie that was a very welcome surprise for me. I wish more franchises in this list would take its cues from this film. Hello, Terminator. We don't need a $200 million sequel. Do something like Prey. Number nine is Terminator Dark Fate. This is just going to be one of those movies that I'm gonna have to take blood pressure medicine every single time that I discuss it because I don't fucking comprehend 
all of the issues that people have with this film. I don't comprehend the vast majority of the criticisms hailed at it, and I fucking despise the fact that a group of fans did everything that they could to sabotage this movie's success, and yet again in this list, we have a very good sequel that we do not get to see where the story would have gone. It's not as good as the first two. 99.9% .9 of fucking movies out there aren't as good as Terminator 1, and especially Terminator 2. You go in with that expectation, you're always gonna be disappointed. It's just like Alien 3. You're a hypocrite for liking this and hating that. No, Alien 3 killed off characters in the opening credits unceremoniously and completely destroyed their character arcs, deeming them worthless to the lore of this franchise. This one kills off John Connor in the opening act to reframe the importance of Sarah Connor, who was always the bigger and more interesting character in the first two films to fucking begin with. The T-800 becoming Carl was just stupid. That was cringe. No, it was an expansion on the idea that was one of the bigger elements of T-2, where the T-800 was learning from his human interactions, learned about emotion and crying and love, and that was just within like three fucking days in the events of that film. Extrapolate that by like 30 years in this film, you're gonna get fucking Carl. It makes sense. This is Whoa. Eat a dick. Danny is a weak character and she's a terrible replacement for John Connor. That's what happens when you cut off the first film in a trilogy right as the character starts to gain some strength. Sarah Connor wasn't a badass until the last 10 minutes of the first film either, but we got to see the rest of her fucking story. And what's up with all this sudden love for John Connor? What the hell did this come from? John Connor is a great character in T2. Beyond that, have they ever really done anything great with his character whatsoever? Because by my count, they completely fucked him up twice. Anytime you talk about the standout characters of the Terminator franchise, you talk about the T-800 and you talk about Sarah Connor. Nobody ever brings up John unless they're trying to argue against this movie. <sighs> Woosah. With that being said, <laughs> I love this movie, if you can't tell. I watched it for the first time today since theaters, and I was a little bit worried because I'm walking in and I'm going, is this going to be a movie that ages poorly for me? Am I finally going to see the plethora of issues that everybody always hails at this film that I did not understand the first time? No, I still don't fucking understand it. This movie's awesome. I genuinely think the way that they reframe this movie to kick off a new trilogy to where Sarah Connor is the integral character. She was the one who is going to teach John to prevent that version of events, but now go on to teach Danny. I think there's something really creative and profound about that. I always hear everybody talk about the Terminator sequels don't do anything different. Dark Fate was the same way. I think they do a lot of things different here. I mean, just Sarah Connor being the focus instead of John and the T-800 being somebody that actually understands human interaction more, that by definition is different enough. But you've got Mackenzie Davis's character here as this augmented human that is a very different take on the Kyle Reese character. And the villain in this movie, the Rev-9, is by a landslide the best villain that we have had in this franchise since the T-1000. That constant issue that this franchise has had about how do you top that. How do you have an upgraded model that is going to be more efficient at killing than that? And they finally cracked the code in this movie. We'll have an endoskeleton and we will have the liquid metal side of it. So now you have two villains in one and you also have the benefits of both. Fucking awesome and brilliant. There's some really great action sequences. It holds onto that dark rated R tone that I love from the first two films. I really enjoy all the characters in this and the way that they've expanded on them in a different way from the first two films. Aside from the fact that it gets a little bit batshit crazy when you have the carrier airplane go all the way to the dam action sequence, it gets a little bit live free or die hard for about 10 minutes there. Other than that, I think this is a fucking awesome Terminator sequel that I will always be pissed off that we never got to see where it went from here because everybody got mad about some spoilers online. They killed John! Fuck this movie! No! Fuck you! Number eight is going to be Ridley Scott's Alien. Now, this is a film that I have always appreciated. I've always enjoyed going back and watching it on occasion. The reason why it is low-ish, <laughs> eight's pretty fucking high, but for a movie that's celebrated like this, people are gonna think it's too low, is because I've always preferred the Aliens style to this franchise. This is much more of a slow burn uh, slasher movie in space, but I like the more action-centric horror that we get in Aliens, Alien Resurrection, movies like that. So I enjoy Alien. I think that it's brilliant for the idea, especially for 
when it came out, I mean, people were just like riveted, like, what the fuck is this thing? What the chestburster scene? Like, that's the scene that I would want to go back in time and sit in a theater and just watch people's reaction to when that thing bursts out. Really good characters. I think that Ripley is used in a very traditional final girl sense in this movie to where she's not really built up to be the main character or developed to that point, And she just ends up being the final character by the end and then turned into an icon by the second film. The design, the H.R. Geiger type design of the Xenomorph is brilliant. One of the best monsters in film history. Very well shot movie. Uh, it, there's really not anything negative I can say about it. It's a brilliant film. It's just not one that I go back and pull off the shelves as often as movies like Aliens. Number seven. Robocop. Now, of all of the bona fide classics on this list, this is the one that I have the least amount of experience with, hence why the sequels are the only first-time watches that I had on this list. So, Robocop is a movie that I always liked the character and the look of Robocop growing up more than I actually watched the movie. I remember like it was yesterday going to a store and my dad bought me like a 12-inch figure of Robocop and even the leg would pop out and you could stick the gun in there and put it back in and I loved that fucking toy. Robocop was just this very badass character, this badass look that I always enjoyed. But it was a movie that never really appealed to me on the level of things like The Terminator. And so it's a movie that I've never really rewatched all that often. This was only the third time that I watched this film in preparation for this list. And I'm glad that I rewatched it because now watching it as an adult, I appreciate it much more than I did as a kid. It's still not on the level of some films above it, obviously, but that Verhoeven style that I love so much about like Total Recall is very much present here. And it's one of the reasons why the Robocop remake just never measures up in most people's eyes because this is just, it's got that it factor. I love the layers of the film regarding the social commentary and the commentation on like over policing people and everything that is there if you wanna find it, but if not, you could still just enjoy the movie on its surface level. Robocop as a character I've always thought looked cool. Uh, more so when I was a kid, like it, it ages a little bit poorly when you watch the film. They're very stiff robotic movements. I don't think is, is as cool as it was back in the 80s. Peter Weller, I love. Don't get me wrong. I love Peter Weller. I think that he does great for what this movie requires, and I love a lot of things that he's done later in his career, especially on TV, Sons of Anarchy, Dexter, uh, Fringe, one of the best episodes of that show. He's fucking awesome. I love Peter Weller. He is not one of those actors matched with a role that I think is irreplaceable. People tend to talk about Peter Weller in RoboCop like this is the only actor that could play this role, and as I've already stated in my RoboCop remake spot, I think Joel Kinnaman fills that perfectly fine. Even to the point where the third film, it took me a bit to realize it wasn't Peter Weller because there's not a whole lot of requirements from this character. Let, let's just be fucking honest. Let's put the fanboy blinders down for a minute and let's be honest. RoboCop is cool, but this is not like a Robert Englund Freddy situation. So I like Weller in the role. Not a huge impact for me personally, nor is any of the side characters, nor is any of the villains. But where this movie makes up for all of that is its extreme hyper-violence with its very interesting path that it takes in its story regarding just a cop getting decimated. Relax, Quagmire. You're doing better than Peter Weller from the opening scene of RoboCop. <laughs> this corporation trying to put machines out on the street to police everybody, and then this perfect opportunity with Alex Murphy, and then the villains of those two stories combining in a very convincing way, unlike the RoboCop remake. And it just goes along this path to where it starts to explore the humanity that is still inside the, mach the machine. So there's just so many things that you can like about this film that I still think is have very impactful and very effective, even if other aspects of the movie are a bit dated. Number six is Total Recall. This is one of my favorite Arnold Schwarzenegger films, and I debated on putting this above my next entry. So it, it, this is how much I like this film. And as I've gotten older, it's the more I appreciate it. This is something to where that Verhoeven style that's very much prevalent in RoboCop, I've always gotten more appeal out of Total Recall. I think it's a very interesting story. It's based off of that Philip K. Dick novel, so it's got very good source material to go from. I think that Arnold Schwarzenegger is great in the lead role. It's not just an action vehicle for him. There's also a lot of things going on within the plot regarding his identity and what is real and what is not. Is it a dream? There's some ambiguity there by the end that's always gonna be debated by fans. There's some good action sequences, some very memorable, just iconic stuff 
like the three-titted girl that actually makes sense in this version of Total Recall. Uh, the guy with the, the mutant hand. There's just so many things about this and the practical effects work that, that still has aged very well that makes this a very wild sci-fi action adventure for me. Number five is The Terminator. This is an absolute classic. These next five or so movies, I feel like I've talked about ad nauseum, so I'm gonna get a little bit quicker, but The Terminator is a fantastic kickoff to a fantastic franchise for an independent film. Aside from some stop motion effects that haven't aged so well, it was done brilliantly for the amount of money that they had, kicked off the career of James Cameron. Uh, don't um actually me about Piranha 2, motherfuckers. Nobody cares about that movie. You have Arnold Schwarzenegger in his career-defining role in here and does a fantastic job. It's a role that, just like with Robocop, doesn't require a lot, but I feel like there's a lot more nuance with what Schwarzenegger has always brought to this role, even in this first film. Uh, Linda Hamilton and Michael Bean are great as the two protagonists and the way that Michael Bean's character is able to come back in time and give us so much information and still feel like a developed character is awesome. I love the way that he interacts with her and this love story that develops between them and the way that the movie kind of does that time continuum thing to where he's sent back to protect her, to protect her son, but he's actually the father of her son and it just, you start to have those question marks and different equations and shit above your head when you think about it too much, but it comes to a very nice little circle by the end of the film that I've always enjoyed revisiting. And I love the fact that this is a straight up horror film. Yes, action is a big piece of it, but I have always found this to be an action heavy slasher film. I think if the Terminator was walking around with a machete, nobody would ever question me on that, but I get a lot of debate. There's so many things in this film that is just classic tried and true elements of a slasher. And I really wish, like I said with Prey, that the Terminator franchise would scale down its budget, would scale down its scope, and do something more akin to this first film, because you're never gonna do better or bigger than T2. It's time to go back to basics, go simple, and do something classic like this original film again. To me, that's the only recipe for success for the Terminator franchise. Number four is The Matrix. This is an awesome film that is iconic, that was just something that changed action and sci-fi for decades. There is still movies that take influence from The Matrix. The way that they filmed the special effects and their slow motion and their action scenes, with people flipping around and bending air and everything, that was all something that came out with this original film. Unless you were there to watch it, you cannot comprehend the impact that The Matrix made. The way that this movie was able to balance a lot of very interesting high concept sci-fi stuff with like martial arts cinema and classic gunplay and hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's just so many different things that this movie is going for and it achieves greatness by being able to balance all of it and being able to execute all of it very well. All the characters are awesome here. And this is the one Matrix film that doesn't get bogged down in all of the lore. It's a little bit high concept at first. It's a little bit hard to comprehend the first time that you watch the film, especially back in the 90s when it came out. But this is a movie that very quickly introduces its concept, gives you your exposition, and then just goes for what you actually want to see, the entertainment value. And that is what all, all three of the sequels completely missed the mark on. Number three is Predator, one of my favorite movies of all time, one of my favorite Arnold Schwarzenegger films of all time, and I absolutely love the Predator design. That is my favorite creature design as far as an alien monster creature is the Predator. I fucking love it. I think that this film is an achievement in the fact that it's an Arnold Schwarzenegger action movie that doesn't feel like he is the sole focus of the movie. He feels like an actor that's a piece of the puzzle, not the whole movie revolving around the character of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and there's one movie on his entire filmography, you could pretty much say that for, and that's Predator. The suspense that's built to where it starts off as kind of a war movie, and then quickly you're introduced to these like sci-fi horror sequences where there's something hunting them and they don't know what it is, and the slow reveal of what it is, eventually leading to a badass third act where he comes to blow with a primal Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is a perfect film in my mind. Coming in at number two is Aliens. Aliens is the best alien film to me. This is kind of the template for what I want whenever they try to do an alien movie and they have never been able to recreate this. When they were announcing that they were gonna do sequels and Neil Blomkamp was gonna go back, I was so excited and then that just got went fucking dead in the water because we just had to have Prometheus. It's probably another reason why I had a little bit of a bias against Prometheus to be honest. But Aliens is a movie that I have always loved. I've always watched it growing up with my dad. 
the different characters here, all the, the colonial marine characters are all completely memorable and iconic. Uh, you've got Lance Henriksen here as the android, who's a great character and a different little foil to the android from the first film, which creates some tension between him and Ripley. Ripley is just far and away a more interesting character in this film and where she is on the level of Sarah Connor as far as just badass female heroines. Uh, you have the queen and the expansion of not just having one xenomorph, but having a whole planet of them. Everything in this movie is let's go bigger, but it also goes better. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. It will always be one of my favorite movies of all time. And it felt wrong not putting it at number one. But unfortunately for Aliens, this is a list where it also has to share the spotlight with my number one. But my number one easily is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. For as much as I love the last four or five films that I have just talked about, as much as on any other day of the week, that would be a very hard list of movies to try to decipher and to try to put in any kind of an order that I would feel comfortable with, T2 was easy number one. As soon as we decided on this theme and this slate of movies, I knew this was my number one because this is the only film that I'm always conflicted on whether or not it's my favorite film of all time. Many of you know, my favorite film of all time, I always say is Die Hard. T2 is a very, very tight second place. And every time I rewatch it, I'm like, ooh, but is it? If there was ever a perfect action film, this is it. I mean, this is just a movie that does everything bigger than the first film, everything better than the first film, in my mind. And all of the different sequences that we go through in Terminator 2 Judgment Day is just like a roller coaster ride over and over again. From the bar fight to the motorcycle chase to the asylum breakout to the siege on Cyberdyne systems to the steel mill. I mean, this movie just never stops with these insane sequences, these insane set pieces, mostly done with practical work that still ages beautifully. Even the digital work here on the T-1000 still ages so damn well for something so simple and so basic with that effect of that liquid metal. It still looks as good now as it did back when this movie came out. You've got the expansion on the character of the T-800 with Arnold now being the helper, the protector, and not the person who's doing the terminating and all of the different exploration they have regarding the robot trying to understand humanity and trying to grow these aspects of humanity, like a conscience, like love, like understanding. Uh, the way that his relationship, like the father and son relationship between him and John is awesome here. You got Linda Hamilton that's just like fucking off the rails in this movie. For as good as she was in the first film, I call her my favorite final girl of all time. The way that she's tougher and she's more grizzled and she's a lot more cynical and she also kind of has to be taught about humanity again by this machine. It's just, it's so profound of a script and it's got so many different ideas going on that are all executed to perfection that it's a movie that no matter how many times that I've watched it, and I've watched it upwards of a hundred times, I never lose a single amount of enjoyment. I never lose a single amount of admiration for this movie. I just, I marvel at how perfect of a film this is. So Terminator 2 Judgment Day, absolutely one of the best movies ever made in the history of planet Earth and it is my number one. Well, that's it for this 31 on 31, guys. If you like this, please click over here for the playlist of all the other episodes that we have done over the past few years and check out everybody else's list in the video description below. Please like and share this video and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss anything in the future. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.